when it's all said and done, it's great to make money, it's great to build a great company, but those relationships tend to, you know, tend to endure. Entrepreneurs tend to share one of two or three different stories, right? There's the I'm going to show them story. There's the my boss is an idiot story, right? Um, uh, there's the my dad was an entrepreneur story, and that you know that's my story. Uh, my dad left a good job in a company here in Louisville when I was maybe you know early teenagers years something like that, and started his own business, and that kind of turned into a series of different things that he did over over time, and so. That whole sort of quit your job and do something new was modeled for me. I saw it growing up. One thing my dad did, which is maybe a little different from some entrepreneurs, I can remember him telling me, uh, there's a million things you can do and there's only one thing you can't do and that's come to work for me, right? And uh, I, I think there's real wisdom in that. I, and different people choose to do that different ways. But um, if you raise kids with the expectation that they got to figure it out for themselves, then they're looking for that. They're not expecting. They're just gonna, you know, work their way up in the family business, right? And so I'm thankful that that kind of never was on my my radar screen. I, I assume my dad was serious about that when he said it. Right? In uh, 1979, after I graduated from college, I went to New York City to work for Arthur Anderson and Company, and kind of learned the accounting profession. Went to school there, earned a master's degree in accounting, and worked for uh, for them in the audit business. Uh, Met my wife there, got married while we were there, um, and this is, you know, 1980, we get married and we discover kind of personal computers through her job, you know, Apple II and, you know, VisiCalc and, you know, it all seems so primitive these days. We, we spent our tax refund uh, in 1981 on, uh, to buy an Apple II and, you know, a little 12-inch uh, black and white screen, you know, one floppy disk drive, you know, 48k of memory. Another 16k would have cost, I think, $300 or something like that for 16k. You know, it's just these numbers are crazy, right? But you know, I didn't know anything about this, but I knew, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen, right? And so, when my wife went to, we moved from New York to Boston to for her to go to graduate school. Uh, I went to work. I quit working for Arthur Anderson. Went to work in a retail computer store because it was the only way I could figure out to kind of learn this business, right? And I'd spend all kinds of hours in there learning the software and the tools. Not doing very much selling. I wasn't very good at that. Retail sales is hard. You know, my dad thought I had lost my mind, right? You know, here I've got this great, you know, job at Arthur Anderson, and even with his entrepreneurial uh, background, he he just thought this is nuts, right? You know, to quit that job and go to work and. One night I was working in the store and um, I got a call from a guy who's selling computer books from a company called Q Corporation in Indianapolis. And I said, well, I, I don't have the authority to buy anything, but I've been thinking about writing a book, you know, if you'd have any interest. And a few minutes later, the CEO of the company calls back. Uh, that led to me doing a couple of books for them on spreadsheet software. And then, you know, after a while I went to work in Indianapolis with that company and that led to writing a book called Lo the Using 123 which was uh, about Lotus 123 and was really a successful book. It sold uh, over a million copies back in the day and uh, and I was working for, uh, for Q and had the idea just as we were finishing that book of uh, newsletters for computer software. You know, I said books are great but they're static. Once they're done, they're done, right? You can do a revision after a while but but it wouldn't it be great to have some way to have a kind of a regular communication with um, the users about this. And so there have been one or two examples of that. So we launched, we put an ad in the back of the book, uh, broke every rule of you know placement and pricing and and within the first three months got 3,000 checks for $60 from people. Uh, that, um, and that convinced me this is a pretty good idea, right? You know, people are sending us money for something we haven't even done yet. We haven't even, you know, not even a sample issue. The CEO didn't want to do that. He didn't like that business. And so um, my wife and I decided we'd quit and come back to Louisville and start a business. We did book publishing uh, and we did these newsletters. We were doing both and we one day, my, Cot Cottingham and I looked at each other and said, you know, let's just get out of this book business. We hate it, you know? 
and he took that and went to Microsoft, sold that business, and we raised a few hundred thousand dollars from selling them kind of the rights to the titles that we'd done. Took every dime of that money, put it into the newsletter business, and over the course of a year, it went from 20,000 subscribers to 200,000 subscribers, right? Uh, we, we decided, you know, instead of doing a lot of different things, we were gonna do one thing and do it really well, and, you know, it worked, right? That first business was kind of different from all the rest, right? Because it was the all-in business, right? We were starting from scratch. We weren't investors. We were, you know, we were all in, right? And I just think, you know, there's a series of really amazing coincidences that, you know, fall together to get me into that that otherwise would have never happened. And to land right in the middle of, you know, what was in that time the most exciting business revolution that ever happened, right? The whole desktop computer thing, right? Later, the internet came along and made that look small, but, you know, at the time, you know, it was really kind of amazing and unprecedented. And we were in there with companies like Microsoft when they were tiny and Apple when they were tiny, all these software companies, you know, it was exciting times. So it helps a lot to be in a rising tide, right? You know, if, if, it would have been hard to screw that business up, right? Um, uh, later, you know, after the Cobb Group, uh, we, I sold it and left, that's when we, um, you know, created Chrysalis and started investing in other people's businesses, right? The game becomes a little different then. Uh, later, I got the chance to, you know, through Chrysalis to invest in and then later go and run the company Apris. And um, that company has been fun just because it has, you know, had real perseverance, persistence, and is you know, has turned into quite a significant company. I ran it from 2000 to 2010, and I handed the reins back over to my uh, partner and friend, Mike Davis, who was the founder, kind of took a step down when I came to be the CEO, worked with me for 10 years, then came back into the CEO role when, you know, I left, and has done an unbelievably great job with the company. And, you know, that company's now up in the, you know, over 100 million revenue range. It's really, you know, five or 600 employees around the country, and. You know, it's turned into something quite significant. So that's been pretty cool too to watch to watch that happen. First as an investor, then as a CEO, now really as a friend, right? You know, I'm not invested anymore, but just continuing to see the story. As much fun as it has been to uh, make money in entrepreneurship, I'm probably having more fun now giving some of that money away in some of the you know things I'm involved with in uh, you know the the world of uh, Christian missions work and other things around the world and you know that's become a kind of a new career for me. I never really thought about creating the wealth when we started, right? You know, it wasn't really the the key thing, the key driver. The, the driver was let's create a company, right? The goal is not to create the money, the goal is to create the company, right? There's a passion for the company and the money becomes a way to acknowledge that you've succeeded in the first goal, right? You know, the selling the company or having the company highly valued is a way of saying, you know, well done on what you're really aiming for, right? Uh, I often will ask, why is Microsoft in Seattle, right? And, and the answer is, it's because where Bill Gates grew up, you know? When he wanted to start a company, started in Albuquerque, but when it started to grow, he wanted to move it back to Seattle. Nobody ever thought about doing technology in Seattle, right? Now, now people do. You know, Dave Jones and Wendell Cherry, you know, start Humana in Louisville. There's no reason that company is in Louisville, you know? It's here because it's where the two of them lived and, you know, we're practicing law. So. Um, you know, if I had to pick anything above, uh, above all else as the key to, you know, how you build an entrepreneurial boom in a place, it would just be getting talented people in that place. And it doesn't take much, you know. One Dave Jones and one Wendell Cherry create a company that, you know, transforms Louisville, right? It, you know, for every one of them, there's a hundred who tried and didn't make it happen. But, you know, it only takes the two of them, so you only have to get lucky a couple of times for that to make a big difference. You know, I do think investing in our universities is a key, a key thing. Um, they are talent magnets, and the better they are, the, you know, the more people will come. And some of them will stay. Some will come here and get educated and go other places, but, you know, some end up staying. It's a nice place to live. In my estimation, in this, in this economy, it's all about the talent. If you've got talent, capital will come, technology will come. Talent is the is the scarce resource. It's the thing you've got to you've got to have to build on. The way industries grow is that you know there's a bunch of competitors at first, and different people own different parts of the space, you know, and then there's consolidation that takes place, and some you know winners emerge. But you don't have to be one of those winners to have a success in a space. As long as you have something to sell in that consolidation phase, um, you can earn a great return on your on your uh, on your investment. Who gets killed there is the guy who has nothing to sell, right? So 
I always tell the entrepreneurs, you know, you're better off owning some hill than trying to own four or five of them and owning none, right? You know, own something because someday you'll have a, somebody will be willing to, to buy that, right? If you get one and you want to get another one, great, let's go get a second. Maybe we can get three or four, right? And you always have to use your judgment about picking a big enough hill and, you know, the right one to tackle all those things. You know, it's not simple. But, you know, in my experience, I've seen a lot more companies fail for lack of folk trying to do too many different things than picking a thing and, and doing it. There's a certain focus and desperation that comes from knowing I've got to sell this or I'm not going to make it than thinking, well, I might sell this or I might sell this or I might sell that, right? And at the end of the day, you don't sell any of them, but you felt good all the whole time thinking, you know, something was going to work. I just kind of never thought that anything I did would fail, right? I mean, things have failed. But it, you know, I've never kind of went into it thinking, well, this might screw up, right? I always assume, well, we'll figure this out one way or another, you know, and more often than not, we, we did. So that may just reflect a very poor risk assessment engine, right? You know, if you remember the movie Dumb and Dumber, uh, where, you know, uh, he asks the pretty girl, uh, so, you know, what are the chances of a, a girl like me and a guy like you, right? And uh, she said, well, not good. Like one in a hundred, he goes, she was like, well, like one in a million. And he goes, so you're telling me there's a chance, right? And whenever I see that movie, whenever I say, that, I just, that's Mike Davis, you know, he's just, yes. one in a million seems like perfectly good odds to him, right? Yeah. Of course we're gonna get it, right? You know, it's always gonna work.